Hello and welcome to Week in One, your wrap of the top stories this week on ENCA. I'm Joanne Joseph. And we start with the question we've all been asking. Will Eskom keep the lights on this year? Well, the answer is yes, but not all the time. On Thursday, Eskom warned that we should be prepared for more load shedding as schools reopen and business gets going. The utility is also battling to keep ageing power stations up and running. Our chief executive officer, Tsudiso. Tsudiso Matona has only been Eskom CEO for a few months. But since assuming the hot seat, Matona has been putting out fires. During the first state of the system address for 2015, Matona admitted that years of deferring maintenance has led to a very unstable system. Our equipment has become so, so, so un unreliable. The risk of breakdown is an ever-present ever reality and that creates havoc for us. Was the pressure politically to keep the lights on at all costs? But the power utility won't say whether political pressure to keep the lights on played any part in deferring maintenance. If the lights had gone off during the World Cup, this country would be in a totally different country. The fact that the lights stayed on is partly why we are where we are today. ESCOM needs 5,000 megawatts to take a plant offline and carry out the maintenance needed without resorting to load shedding. But it's already running the country's backup power to its limit. This includes the costly open cycle diesel powered turbines at a whopping 1 billion rand per month. ESCOM is calling on South Africans to play their part and reduce electricity usage by at least 10%. The utility also advises to prepare for unplanned bouts of load shedding as the country's power plants are old, overused and unpredictable. Narissa Subramani, Johannesburg. Well, another major challenge for Eskom is illegal connections, which essentially steal power from the grid. It's also a highly dangerous activity. In KwaZulu-Natal this week, Princess Nduli was laid to rest after she was electrocuted. The 37-year-old was carrying a bucket of water on her head when barefoot she stepped on a cable. Angry residents of the Nsaweni informal settlement have since torched the house of the two men who connected the cables. Princess Ntuli was electrocuted by a cable connected to her neighbor's corrugated iron roof. Hey, the Kwadukuza municipality says illegal electricity connections are an ongoing problem. Our residents uh, continue connecting illegally, uh, most mainly because uh, they sometimes rent out their houses to the tenants. So to, for them to make quick money, they connect illegally and charge people for the electricity. There have been similar deaths in KZN recently. Last week, a five-year-old girl was electrocuted by an illegal connection at an informal settlement in Peter Maritzburg. A day later, a 33-year-old man was killed the same way at another informal settlement in the province's capital. Statistics show 85.4% of households had access to electricity in 2013. But more than 14% were without formal supplies. Government says electricity theft cost the economy 7.5 billion rand every year. Judith Subban, Kwadukusa. The school year got underway for many regions of South Africa on Wednesday. While education faces many challenges, there are also some exciting changes up ahead this year. Seven Gauteng schools are getting ready to ditch their books, moving towards a paperless education. Deputy President Sul Ramaphosa unveiled the classroom of the future in Tembisa. It's high tech, and officials are now hoping the gadgets will boost the matric results. Unwrapping a new generation of education in South Africa, technology. At a cost of 7 million rand at this school, every child between grade 7 and grade 12 has his or her own tablet now. Government says it will cost 17 billion rand to roll this system out to all schools across the province over the next five years. 
the private sector is watching carefully. The tablets that are being produced here, that are, that are given to our learners, are now going to be produced here in Houghton. That's part of re-industrialization. A power cut during the launch has, however, prompted critics to question if government should first fix the basics. There was a power outage, and the question is, when their power outage is at the school and the deputy president, is, deputy president isn't here, what are they going to do? Another concern is student safety. We are coming from far places, but at least this tablet has a tracker. Whether it's under the bed or on top of a shack, we'll retrieve it back and give it to the learner. Governments say the classroom of the future is just one step towards South Africa's e-economy, where everything from healthcare to home affairs will be paper free. Yusuf Omar, Tembisa. The embattled education department in Limpopo will be steering its own ship this year for the first time since it was placed under administration in 2012. There are signs the province has turned the corner despite huge challenges. Three years ago, less than half of the matriculants at Monyang Secondary School passed. But in an unprecedented result, the pass rate climbed from a poor 39.7% in 2011 to an astonishing 92.3% in 2014. Without a library, computer center, science lab or even a school hall, Monyong has managed to thrive. So what is the secret behind this school's turnaround and success? Since arriving in 2012, Principal Tabo Mashapu runs a tight ship. All teachers must be at school on time and in class teaching every day. And often, even on their off days. While there is a lot of hard work, it's not easy to come here on Saturdays when you have got other family commitments, but we, we do come here and the learners are giving us that support. Pupils have also played their role. We, the children of Munyo Secondary School, don't have all the facilities and our infrastructure is not as excellent as expected, but we still are trying to do something which is more much better. And it may not be long before the facilities at Monyang improve. We don't have a library yet. It says a lot. And excellence must be rewarded. Monyong is now chasing a 100% pass rate in matric for 2015. And as a shining example to other under-resourced schools, this school's determination should be mirrored everywhere in the country. Nikolaus Bauer, Hamatlala, Limpopo. The investigation into the group copying scam during the 2014 matric exams continued this past week. Matriculants and invigilators could face criminal charges if they're found guilty of cheating, and they could also be barred from writing matric for up to three years. Scores of invigilators have now appeared at hearings after officials found more than 5,000 irregularities. Chief invigilators are among the first to be grilled by basic education officials. They've all been implicated in the group copying debacle. Forensic audits are also underway to determine whether or not invigilators may have received financial rewards for their alleged role in the incident. Those found guilty could lose their jobs and have criminal charges laid against them. Between the 20th and the 23rd of January, affected matriculants will be given an opportunity to tell their side of the story. They risk having their results declared null and void or being barred from writing matric for up to three years. What we need to say and emphasize is that if you cheat, you will get caught. And some people are already stressing as we speak. Investigators say they want the process sped up to allow students who have been cleared of any wrongdoing to register at tertiary institutions on time. Judith Subban, Durban. Well, this past week saw some movement on Gauteng's controversial e-tolls. The panel is suggesting more review, but it's something of a victory for those opposed to the system. Gauteng Premier David Makura has admitted the tolls aren't affordable and need to change. In its current form, the e-toll system is unaffordable and inequitable, and it places a disproportionate burden on low- and middle-income households. From a cost point of view, 
and then it is also administratively too cumbersome. But it appears that despite these stumbling blocks, e-tolls are here to stay. The key issue is not whether to fund our roads. The key issue is not the user pay principle. Whilst those are supported, the key issue is that this, the, a hybrid funding model that's affordable, that's equitable, that's also sustainable should be looked at. A meeting what, between what interested parties who made submissions uh, in the review process right? will take place next month. After the break, we find out what's happening at the Hawks with their suspended boss and we check in with our neighbours in the region battling severe flooding. Stay with us.